Hi, I'm Emily Smith and I'm the 2020 Monroe County Junior Fair Queen and today we are doing a virtual tour of two robotic dairy farms. All right, welcome everybody to the Farm Science Review. Today we are at Albright Jersey Dairy Farm and they're going to be giving us a little bit of background information on the farm's history right now and how they got to where they are. Um, they're milking with Laley robots. It's very exciting, the technology that's available in agriculture and all the careers that are available and how that changes the way farmers manage the farm and utilize the data they can utilize coming off of all this technology. And Joel, would you like to give us a little bit of background on how you got to where you are today, the farm's history, and what you have here on the robotics side? Our farm is a family farm that uh, started milking Jersey cows in 1947 uh, when my grandfather came home from the service. Uh, my grandfather, Alan, milked cows originally in a 32 stall tie stall barn. Uh, in 1977, uh, they built a freestall barn and a herringbone parlor. Um, in 2002, we stretched that parlor to a double eight. And then in 2011, we went to a, a double 16 Parabone parlor. And uh, in 2018, we started up our uh, Laley robots. Originally, they milked uh, about 100 cows uh, in the 70s and 80s. Uh, we grew closer to 200 cows in the 90s. And uh, we've grown all the way up to close to 600 cows milking at this point. You had mentioned, Joel, that this is a family operation. Would you like to introduce your family that you're going to have helping us here today, talking about some of the robotics? Okay, so today uh, my wife Mary Beth Albright and Lauren Albright will be a part of our video. We also have a son, Luke, um, who wasn't able to be here today, but he's uh, eight, going on nine. Um, this Lauren just completed her second year of 4-H in Huron County. All right, thanks, Joel. What led you in the direction of going to the robotics that we're going to be moving on to look at and talk about? Our facilities uh, were at a point where uh, they didn't have a lot of life left in them and uh, we were at a, a point where we had to really consider all of our options whether we were going to build a new parlor, uh, utilize robots, or exit the dairy industry. We chose robots primarily um, to utilize some technology, um, make some progress in some areas on our dairy farm that we felt like we could grow and get better at. Um, our labor situation was always challenging uh, to find plenty of people that wanted to be a part of a dairy farm and be a part of our team. Uh, so having robots gave us an opportunity to have a smaller workforce and uh, try to utilize um, a group of people that really enjoyed being around cows. I'm Jason Workman and this is my wife Leslie. Uh, we're at our dairy farm, Blue Sky Farm. It's been in my family since uh, I guess my great great grandpa. So we'd be the fifth generation uh, farming it. Um, we took over from my dad uh, two and a half years ago, um, I served in the Army for a little while and for six years and whenever we come back, uh, we come back and wanted to, to farm and raise our family on the farm. So we come back here and uh, started farming with my dad uh, for a year after we got back and then we uh, took over, built this barn last year. Uh, actually a year ago, next week, next week uh, we started milking in this facility. Uh, with a robot. Before that, we had an old barn that was built in the 70s uh, and milked in a, in a uh, double seven herringbone parlor. Uh, at our farm here, we milk 60 head, roughly, of brown Swiss, um, fully registered herd. Uh, I guess the reason we st stuck with Swiss, really, we didn't choose them. Uh, Grandpa chose them. And uh, we just kept the Swiss breed. Dad's always loved the Swiss and uh, I grew up with them. Um, Leslie grew up with Holsteins and I've worked on other farms with Holsteins. We kind of just went with the Swiss because that's what we had. Um, in my mind some people argue with you that Swiss aren't as good as Holsteins. 
I think that uh, a good cow is a good cow, whether it's black and white, brown, whatever color it is. Uh, so we stuck with the Swiss and uh, also kind of want to push them. A lot of times Swiss are just thought of as a show cow and uh, I want to see what we can do on the commercial side with them. Why did you guys make the transition to robots and what was the transition like? One of the main reasons that uh, we were leaning towards robots and uh, started looking into it in the first place is because uh, we wanted to raise our family on a farm and we saw how much time growing up that it took up and we, we wanted to have a little bit more uh, flexibility and freedom uh, raising our kids on the farm. So uh, the robot in general has just freed up a lot of hours that we normally would have spent in the parlor um, milking where we can use that time to do other things on the farm, better manage things. Uh, the technical information that we get from the robot, uh, i.e. cow health, uh, milk quality, uh, things like that, that some people can have in a parlor system. Uh, we didn't have it in ours. Uh, and instead of updating to where we had all that, um, we took advantage of what we got with the robot for that information, uh, as well as the time freedom and, and uh, just having that flexibility to be able to go work on something else, if it be making feed or something uh, like that. We weren't set to a 12 and 12 milking schedule or uh, being tied to that parlor for four to six hours a day. Uh, when we, as he said earlier, we are coming up on our one year anniversary of uh, milking in this facility. And thinking back to that, we had a, I would say a fairly easy transition. I, I think he would agree with that. <laughs> yeah. um, a lot of people sometimes try to do like pre-training and all that. We were bringing our cows in from another facility, so it was they showed up in this barn and we immediately started uh, pushing them through the robot. Um, so we have all brown Swiss and they tend to be a little more nosy and a little more curious, which I think uh, definitely helped us out with our transition. Um, by the second day, some of them were already going through on their own. Um, we had help, you know, pushing the cows and everything for the first few days, and then we were on our own, and they they took really well to it. Um, every now and then we'll get a stubborn one, but for the most part, they they've all really adapted very well to it. Another thing that helped make the transition a lot smoother was all the the neighbors that chipped in. Uh, Emily's family helped us out. Uh, her dad and her uncle both came over. Uh, some of our friends came over and helped us push cows. Uh, WG Dairy. Their techs stayed here around the clock uh, for the first four, three days, three days. Three days. Um, and they were m monitoring our system the whole time. Um, once they did leave uh, for weeks, uh, they watched it, monitored it, let us know if something was up, called and checked in on us. Uh, so we, we had a lot of help. The cows played a big role in making it simple, but uh, we also had a lot of neighbors that helped us out. How has the robot changed your daily routine? Uh, the robot, having the robot itself has definitely changed what our normal like day-to-day -day looks like. Um, everybody kind of has the mindset when they think of a dairy farm, you know, you're up at the crack of dawn um, milking the cows. We used to, you know, we always had to be in the parlor at 4.30 and 4.30. Um, now the cows are getting milked while we're sleeping. So um, we, you know, get to sleep in a little bit later in the morning, maybe if we want. Um, we get up, we have well, like an hour between feeding and doing just normal um, everyday kind of maintenance things on the robot, um, feeding calves and all that stuff, probably about two hours, yeah. two hours in the morning and maybe a little less than that in the evening. So versus in a parlor when you're doing all that, you're looking at maybe six, six hours a day, depending on how many cows you're milking. Um, definitely freed him up a lot more because you don't have to stop in the evenings when you're doing field work because the cows are continuing to be milked while you're out, you know, making hay or whatever. So that has definitely helped us out a lot. So this is kind of the whole brains behind the robot. Um, this is where this screen right here is going to give us all of the technology or all of the information that this technology provides. Um, so it's empty right now, but uh, when a cow comes in, it'll pull up all of her information. 
Um, they walk into this box here and there's actually a scale on the floor so that helps us keep tabs on their weight um, which can also help us pick up on um, illnesses and things faster. Um, this arm will move and go you know underneath the fur basically it's doing everything that a person would do if they were in a parlor milking um, as far as um, prepping the udder um, we got brushes here it's gonna brush their teeth off um, I think it does two cycles of spray two different kinds of spray um, it'll spray them when they're done so post dip versus um, in a traditional parlor you'll see people using this um, that's just one more thing that it already does for you So for a cow to get milked in a robot, a lot of things have to happen. Number one, the cow has to be identified. Um, this collar, you'll notice every cow when they come through the robot, they're going to be wearing a collar. And it has several parts. Uh, the, the most important part probably is the transponder. Um, this transponder uh, is used uh, to identify D the cow when she comes in, every cow is going to have a unique ID. Um, and there's a tag reader in the front of the robot that identifies the cow as she comes in. Um, this tag reader, or this transponder serves several other purposes. Um, it has a pedometer um, and it also tracks rumination. Uh, so this collar has to be oriented uh, so that the transponder is on the left side of the cow at about the 11 o'clock position um, so that when the cow is laying it can tell when it rocks back and forth and it actually counts rumination minutes um, and we can track each cow's uh, digestive health just by rumination. Um, this weight at the bottom of the collar helps keep this transponder oriented where we need it to be. So when a cow enters a robot First, she's ID'd, and uh, each cow um, has teat coordinates that are known uh, from a seven-day average. Uh, the brush arm here will make two passes uh, for a USA wash cleaning cycle. Um, it'll brush each teat based off that teat coordinate average. Um, now you're seeing the brushes being cleaned with a uh, food grade sanitizer with, which is uh, parasitic acid and peroxide mixed uh, in a water solution. Um, after the teeth are uh, sanitized the second time, you'll see an air blow on each teeth to help dry them. Our two-pass brush system is set up to uh, hit about a minute and 30 seconds from touch to attach, which is ideal for milk wet down and stimulation. Uh, once the teats have been prepped, um, you're going to see the scanner scan each of the teats. Um, once the coordinates are found, uh, the, the robot will attach each teat, uh, starting in the rear and working to the front.
So when a cow gets milked, uh, the milk automatically comes from here and is pumped into this jar. And then depending on whether that cow goes to the main bulk tank where our milk is stored till it's picked up by a hauler, or if it, she's had antibiotics or a fresh cow, meaning that we don't want her milk going into that tank and contaminating the other milk, uh, this jar, it'll be stored in this jar and then when she's all done, uh, it sends that milk to its destination. So it'll go down the, through here into this pipeline and if we want to use it for calves, if she's been had antibiotics, she's treated, or if she's a fresh cow, we want the colostrum to feed our calves. It goes into these buckets on the wall over here, um, and we can come in and, and get that milk to feed the calves. Uh, if she's treated and we don't want that milk, it'll put it down the drain. And uh, if she's a normal cow and she's gone into the bulk tank, uh, it'll pump that milk out and um, up into this line here, which runs all the way down our barn and over into our milk house and into the bulk tank where it's stored uh, for two days, um, well, a day and a half. And then we have a truck driver that comes, picks our milk up with the rest of the dairy farmers in the county and takes it uh, down to United Dairy in Martins Ferry. Each robot has a display screen. Uh, there's going to be a variety of information that we can see at the robot about an individual cow. Um, we feed two different pellets to the robots. We feed a 20% commodity pellet, and then we also top dress uh, with a second pellet that's got some bypass protein and uh, other goodies to uh, drive high-end milk production. Um, we see some numbers here on our progress. That would be the time uh, expected in the box for this cow. Uh, we also see the progress by quarter of how much milk flow the cow is having. And uh, like I said before, when the cows get to 45% of peak milk flow in each quarter, it'll detach each quarter. Uh, another kind of advantage of the collars is um, with the breeding, it's helped us get cows pregnant faster. Uh, and a cow's lactation cycle, whenever she calves, is when she starts milking. Uh, usually, they'll milk pretty heavy um, up until about 150, 160 days, uh, and then they'll start to drop off. So for us to keep cows milking, we want to get them pregnant so that we can uh, turn them dry and let them have kind of a vacation uh, to, to come back into milk after they calve. Um, and for a dairy farm, you ideally want your whole herd to average their days in milk around 150, and uh, we struggled before to get our, our herd there, and uh, now we're starting to get down. Um, right now we're at 200 days in milk. We're still, uh, a year is kind of not long enough to bring that back to where we want it. Uh, so next year at this time, I expect to see us down around 180 or lower uh, and keep getting back closer to that 150 um, year round and, and maintain it at, at, at that. Going from the parlor to robots, you get a lot of data that comes in. What are the important parts of that data that you, you, you utilize off of the computer? What do they tell you and how do you use them? So one of the things that um, is unique about our upgraded milking systems um, that can be utilized either in a new parlor uh, with IDs and milk weights and uh, collars or uh, in a robotic system is that you can have um, KPIs which are key performance indicators um, in a robotic system some of the KPIs that we look at every day uh, would be uh, milkings per cow uh, production uh, we look pretty close at refusals and failures uh, refusals are how many times the cows try to get milked or uh, but it's not um, time for them to get milked uh, based off of our milk access settings. And uh, failures would be how many uh, cows uh, try to get milked that the robots can't milk. Um, looking at those failures every day will give you an indication on which uh, robots need the most attention and maintenance and uh, can help you be more efficient with your box time and uh, overall harvest a milk per box. Some other key performance indicators that, that we look at um, would be box time. Um, 
at the end of the day, box time is uh, a pretty valuable commodity in a robot system. It's going to affect how many cows that can be milked and uh, how many uh, pounds of milk can be harvested uh, per robot. And those become some of the metrics that affect the uh, cost of production in a robotic milking system. Another key performance indicator would be free time. Uh, free time is uh, the amount of time that the robot sits idle. Um, in a robotic milking system, when you drop below 10% free time, uh, you're going to start becoming counterproductive, uh, meaning that your number of cows that you have to fetch and get through the robot so they get milked um, is going to go up. The uh, number of milkings per cow is going to go down and uh, at some point you're just not going to be able to deal with any breakdowns or downtime uh, without having negative effects on overall milk production. Uh, some of the key indicators that are useful uh, for managing cow health would be rumination minutes. Uh, we monitor rumination minutes uh, to uh, get an overall idea of how the, the health of our cows is going. Uh, whenever we have ration changes, uh, that's a good opportunity to uh, evaluate those decisions that were made and adjustments and uh, decide if they are going to put your cows in a spot where eventually you're going to start having some health issues. Uh, related to uh, ration changes. What kind of data does the robot record about your cows? So this is the home screen that you're seeing here on our computer. Uh, when we come to the barn in the mornings or after we haven't been here uh, during the day, like when we come in for evening chores, the first thing we look at is this screen here. Uh, the number on the left is the last 24 hour average um, or total uh, for this example right here, total milk production, that's how much milk uh, in pounds was produced from this robot uh, in the last 24 hours. Uh, the parentheses number is um, the actual seven day average, the last seven day average. So this looks like uh, dials. Uh, some people always ask whenever they come, was well, red bad or is green good? You know, what's, what's all that telling you? Um, and it is kind of overwhelming when you first come in here until you learn uh, what all the information is telling you. Uh, sometimes if you're clear up in the green, it's, uh, it'll be, it's good for you, but it's just the, the collars are just showing what the last 24 hours are compared to the last seven day average. Uh, so one thing that was actually alarming today and, and uh, yesterday we had preventive maintenance on the robot so it was shut down for several hours uh, and that caused us to have a little bit of trouble. Um, you see here it says failures. Failures are when a cow comes in to be milked and for whatever reason she does not get fully milked, whether it be the robot doesn't attach to her properly or there's a problem and it doesn't milk out a quarter on her. Uh, it'll, it'll label her as a failure. Um, as you can see, we were down at six for seven days. The last 24 hours we went up to 17. Uh, a lot of that is due to the being shut down. The cows come in with more milk in their udders and the robot has a little bit of trouble finding those teats. Um, when those cows have full, fuller udders uh, compared to what it's used to uh, when they're coming in. Um, and actually, that's one thing back to uh, WG Dairies who installed our robot. They actually called me today. Uh, like I said before, they monitor our system all the time. Um, and they actually called me today and wanted to know what was going on if I saw this and uh, if I knew why it was doing that. So uh, we, we uh, identified some stuff and, and then we go in and, and can can fix it. Our nutritionists, the cows are fed a balanced diet to help them maximize their milk production and components. Our nutritionists actually helped us set up some groups so that we can pull up our fresh cows, our zero to 30 days in milk cows, and get an idea just quickly if they're going in the right direction or not. You want to see those cows continue to go up. Uh, today, in the last 24 hours, those cows are at 86.1 pounds. Um, the last seven day average, they were at 71. So they're headed in the right direction. It helps us quickly diagnose if there's problems with our fresh cow protocols or with the, the ration. 
another uh, report that the robot gives us that I like to look at is this uh, cow daily production. Um, it just gives us a little bit more information so we can identify if there's an X in this column. Uh, we can quickly glance down through and find if there's an X that shows cow's production is too low for that day, meaning that her percentage of deviation or the difference between what she normally gives in a 12 hour or 24 hour period is, is a, a considerable amount lower uh, to quickly identify maybe if something's wrong with her. Sometimes if a cow is uh, in heat, she's more active, she doesn't go eat as much. Uh, that could cause that, or a cow that's getting sick, or a cow that's lame, has a sore foot. Uh, a lot of times we can pick them up here uh, very quickly uh, and get the problem solved. Uh, this column here gives us our total programmed feed. The robot gives them a pellet uh, in addition to what they get out at the feed bunk. Uh, the pellet just gives them a little bit more energy and protein, um, and it's balanced based off of their days in milk and based off of how much milk they're giving, so we're not wasting feed. Uh, this column here gives us our rest feed, so that's the feed that the cow actually leaves in the robot. Um, the fresh cows, we don't want to see them leaving very much in the robot. We want to see them cleaning that up. Uh, as they go up in days in milk, you'll see that their amount that they're fed continues to go up. So we want to see that they're, they're following that. They're eating as much as we're allowing them to have. Uh, over here in this column, we have our days pregnant. Uh, we can quickly just pull up if we have a question about a cow or wonder what's going on with the cow. We can find out uh, how many days pregnant she is uh, and go from there on management decisions. Uh, the column over here is our fat and protein indications. Um, those are two components of milk. Uh, Brown Swiss are typically known for having higher butter fat and higher protein, uh, which we get paid uh, a little bit more money for our milk for that. Uh, this column here gives the ratio between the two on our fresh cows. Um, I actually just started learning to use this a little, a little better. Our fresh cows can get metabolic disorders that will decrease the amount of milk that they're giving. Uh, one of those disorders is called ketosis and uh, this fat and protein ratio directly correlates with ketosis. So if it goes up above 1.5 we know that they're getting ketosis and we can treat them um, more quickly, uh, we call it clinical and subclinical. Uh, clinical being they actually have physical signs of ketosis. Uh, subclinical meaning that you don't, you can look at the cow and you can't identify it uh, just by looking at her uh, unless you pull blood on her or this report actually gives us that. Uh, we were pulling blood samples on our cows uh, every couple days after they were fresh and watching uh, what their le BHB levels were uh, and trying to identify ketosis that way and, and after we got this report set up and I learned to use it a little better uh, I don't have to take the time to pull the blood uh, I can come in here look at this report and find out hey do I need to treat that cow for ketosis or not uh, and, and by identifying it subclinically versus clinically we can treat them with uh, just propylene glycol versus an IV uh, get them back on their feet faster a lot of times we don't even have to IV cows for ketosis or other uh, fresh cow problems. We can identify it quickly, get them treated uh, with a minimal amount of, of medicine uh, or supplements and uh, get them back into production or max out their capabilities. Uh, this is just another report that we sometimes use to identify uh, areas that we can improve in management. Uh, this tells us our milkings per hour so we kind of get an idea um, from the cows when they're using the robot the most and when we're interfering with that. Um, so down here you have your hour of the day so this would be midnight and this would be 11 o'clock at night and here you have your successful milkings meaning how many cows actually were milked in the robot in that hour. Um, the robot shuts down to clean three times a day we can identify that it shuts down at one o'clock cows you can't get as many milkings it's shut down for at least 20 minutes so we see a drop there it shuts down again at 9 and it shuts down again at 5 to wash. So we see those always drop down. We run our feed out between 8 and 9 o'clock every morning. We try to time it so that whenever the robot's washing, the cows can be over there eating and utilize the time that they have to actually go to the robot. Um, so that's why you'll see a little bit of a decrease here. Um, but what we found, what was interesting, is our cows actually are most active at 11 o'clock at night. Um, they're coming in six and a half times uh, or six and a half milkings at 11 o'clock at night. So one thing that that tells us is uh, when we're not in the barn, 
is when the cows are using the robot the most. Uh, whenever we come in in the mornings, at like 7 o'clock we show up, we push cows that haven't been to the robot. The robot will let us know, here's your collect list, meaning cows that haven't been to the robot um, in a certain amount of time, whatever that time be according to their uh, days of milk. I said whenever we time the way we feed, we time it so that when the cows are at the bunk eating, the robot's washing, so we're not interfering with that. At that same time, we also scrape stalls uh, and put fresh bedding in uh, and scrape the crossovers so that we're not interfering with those cows. What are other types of features that you built into your barn? Uh, when we designed our barn, we tried to design it with as many efficiencies in mind as we could, as well as cow comfort. Uh, as you see here, we put alley scrapers in. Uh, our scrapers are set to run every hour. Uh, just to keep the manure out of the alley, it helps keep the cows cleaner. Uh, we tried running them uh, a little less often than that, and uh, the cows would lay in the stalls, we'd get their tails in uh, wet, sloppy manure, and then sling it all over their sides and their udders. So we found that turning it up to run every hour actually is helping us out at keeping the cows cleaner. Um, you can also notice that we put water beds in. Uh, cow comfort is a huge, huge thing to us, so we try to uh, do whatever we can to make the cow as comfortable as possible and to take care of her as, and, and help uh, keep cows around longer. Um, whenever we were designing the barn, we at first wanted to put in a bedded pack barn, but sawdust was kind of hard to find or bedding was hard to find at the time, so we steered away from that and decided to go with the water beds. We can use a lot less bedding this way and still give that, those cows that cushioning uh, that a pack would give them. Another technology that we utilize on the farm is a feed pusher. Uh, this robotic feed pusher will, will run once an hour and make a lap through our barn, uh, pushing up feed uh, for the cows. Uh, we find that the feed pusher uh, is helpful in robotic cow flow uh, because when the feed gets pushed up it encourages cows to get up from the free stalls and, and the normal cycle for a robot cow is to get up, go eat, go get milked and lay back down. So the more times she gets up and eats, uh, the more frequently she'll uh, potentially decide to go get milk and that reduces the number of fetch cows that we have and, and balances out the amount of robot visits per hour throughout the day. So we actually have two robots on the farm. Uh, one does the milking, the other one pushes up feed. Uh, this is the Juno feed pusher. Um, so if cows don't eat and don't drink, they don't milk. And with our feeding system, we have it uh, drive-through feeding. Uh, traditionally, we'd have to come through here uh, multiple times in a day and push up uh, feed. The Juno does that for us now. It just, again, gives us that flexibility to stay out in the field or to be doing whatever other tasks that we have to be doing um, without worrying about pushing up feed. Uh, so we installed the cow brush, uh, the Lely Luna, uh, when we built the barn, just to kind of give the cows, cows get bored. Uh, they like to do stuff, scratch on stuff. Um, we like the idea of having the cow brush here. It lets the cows go and uh, get scratched, brushes them off. Uh, helps keep them a little bit cleaner and uh, a lot of times you'll see them come from the feed bunk they'll be lined up and come over here to the brush and then go from the brush to the robot. Uh, another feature of our barn is we chose to do kind of a, a unique hybrid barn uh, between tunnel ventilation and conventional uh, ventilation. Um, we chose this route to try and keep our barn from freezing in the winter time. Uh, we have eight 72 inch fans on one wall of the barn uh, that pulls the air from the other end of the barn down through the barn and blows it out. Uh, we took some wind tests whenever it was 90, I think 98 degrees this summer. Uh, we did some tests in here just to see if it was working. Uh, at the doors where the air is coming in, it was uh, six mile an hour wind. Um, at the stalls where the cows are laying, uh, we had a three mile an hour wind and down in front of the fans we had a five mile an hour wind. Um, and our temperature inside the barn was 10 degrees cooler uh, than outside, so it's doing what we want it to do. Um, with the hybrid, why I say we have a hybrid barn, uh, usually a tunnel ventilated barn has solid sides, meaning it don't have curtains that you can roll up or down. Uh, we sit, our farm sits on top of a hill and we get a lot of wind, so I like the idea of having 
the option to shut those fans down on windy days and open the curtains up and let the natural air blow through and, and cool the barn down. Um, and then in the winter time, we can close those curtains and close, shut the fans down. Uh, usually if it gets stuffy in here, we can kick one fan on uh, and keep the barn from freezing. opportunities to service agriculture uh, in the dairy industry um, we work with a lot of vendors we have people that um, help us with our feed and nutrition we have people that uh, work as service providers and provide the maintenance for our robots uh, those technicians need to have a variety of skills um, a lot of engineering skills mechanical skills um, the ability to work uh, through electrical scenarios and plumbing. Uh, so most all of your construction trades are encompassed in a, a robot project. Um, we also have to maintain all that equipment and uh, a lot of that we try to do ourselves but uh, we also need some very skilled technicians to help us. In addition we need people that are available to uh, deal with some of our unique computer situations uh, with the robots as well. Uh, some other careers uh, could include AI technicians. We have a armed service come and breed our cows every day. Uh, those are some really good paying jobs. And uh, we also have a hoof trimmer that comes once a month uh, to trim feet uh, on our cows.